Welcome to Justice Counts, the podcast that goes beyond the law to what's important to you. Equal justice for all is a guidepost for our nation, but how do we achieve that? Here are your hosts, writer-commentator Bob Gaddy and novelist-attorney Mark M. Bello. As we continue to experience mass shootings, seemingly one after the other, children and other innocent people are slaughtered. Voices choking, politicians speak of grief. Then nothing happens except that parents must choose caskets and plan funerals. When will it end? That's the topic today with our guest, a longtime Connecticut lawmaker who led the charge for gun laws there that should serve as a model for the nation. Mike Lawler, Associate Professor of Criminal Justice at the University of New Haven, is a nationally recognized expert on criminal justice reform. That was a major focus of his 24 years as a member of the Connecticut House of Representatives and as former Connecticut Governor Daniel P. Malloy's Undersecretary of Criminal Justice Policy and Planning. Lawler is working with the University of New Haven's Tau Institute for Youth Justice, discussing issues such as prevention, recidivism, sentencing, and the treatment of youth as adults. Lawler authored the 1999 Red Flag Gun Law for Connecticut, the first state in the country to pass this law now considered a national model for preventing mass shootings. That's the primary reason that my co-host, novelist attorney Mark Ambello, and I invited Mike to join us today. Mike, thanks for being with us on the podcast. Glad to be here, Bob. Mike, uh, I I would like to echo um, Bob's uh, thank you. Bob's intro indicated that you authored the Connecticut law, and that was 23 years ago. I presume, at least I hope, that Washington politicians are considering something similar as a response to all of the, uh, not just the recent mass shootings, but all of the mass shootings we've experienced in this country over the last several years. Can you tell us what the Connecticut law says and does and how that would work at the federal level, let's say? Yeah, sure. I mean, it's it's a great question, Mark. And uh, um, the, the, I think the easiest way to begin to describe the Connecticut law is to describe the circumstances that led up to its um, introduction and enactment, right? So uh, in 1998 in Connecticut, there, is, uh, there was an incident we refer to as the lottery shooting. A um, guy who had been working at the Connecticut State Lottery headquarters uh, was having a lot of emotional problems at work, ends up taking a leave of absence. Uh, he was making his coworkers very nervous, uh, et cetera. So they gave him like a six month leave of absence. So uh, during that period of time, he ended up moving in with his parents. Uh, while he lived there, he started acquiring a lot of firearms. Uh, at some point, attempts to commit suicide, the police get involved. Uh, you know, they're able to save his life. Uh, and after that, he continues to accumulate firearms. Uh, His parents actually reach out to the police and they say, we're actually very nervous uh, about our son. You know, he's obviously got some issues. Uh, He's starting to obsess about firearms. At the same time, uh, he was nearing the end of his leave of absence and his uh, coworkers back at the lottery headquarters were beginning to become concerned he was going to come back and they weren't sure what he would do. And they communicated that to their supervisors. And in both cases, um, the police, the local police and the, the supervisors in the workplace said, well, there's really nothing we can do. He hasn't broken any laws. He hasn't committed any crimes. You know, he's hopefully he's chilled out a little bit since he's been gone. And on the day before he was due to uh, return to work, he went to the lottery headquarters, walked down the hallway and shot and killed a whole bunch of uh the senior management there at the lottery, and then uh, walked down to the parking lot and killed himself. And after this happened, uh, you know, I was in the legislature at the time. I was chair of the Judiciary Committee, sort of in a position to uh, figure out solutions to problems. And, you know, it occurred to me that uh, what the police were saying was actually true. There was nothing they were allowed to do under the law 
but there should be, right? There's got to be some mechanism that we can provide the police with that allows them to take action under circumstances where there's a clear indication that someone is in imminent danger to themselves or to others, and they possess a lot of firearms. Um, and at the same time, do it in a way that's consistent uh, with the United States Constitution, with the, with the Fourth Amendment, first and foremost, about searches and seizures, and also with the Second Amendment. So uh, that began a year-long process of meeting with mental health advocates. We have some of the best experts in forensic psychiatry here in New Haven because of Yale University. And talking to advocates on both sides, you know, some of the gun folks and some of the anti-gun folks. And the end result was a law that was carefully crafted uh, and ended up getting supported by uh, about half of the Republicans in our House of Representatives. And many of them are uh, consider themselves to be real advocates for gun owners' rights. And that's how the law took effect. It's designed to be a last resort. So in other words, if the police have no other options available, they can apply for a warrant that would allow them to go in, seize a person's firearms, and refer them to a, a mental health evaluation. Now, what's the process by which this is done? So under our law, um, if someone reaches out to the police and indicates they have a concern that A, someone's got firearms, and B, they are posing, they appear to be posing a risk to either themselves or others, the police can begin an investigation. And if they can come up with what they believe uh, is probable cause, uh, just like you would with a search warrant or an arrest warrant, go to a judge with an affidavit. If the judge authorizes it, it allows them to go to a place, seize the firearms, and as I said, refer the person to a mental health evaluation. And at that point, uh, the person has full due process rights. To, you can, he's entitled to a hearing in court within a week. Uh, a judge would have to find by clear and convincing evidence that the person continues to pose a risk to himself or to others, uh, can uh, withhold the firearms from the person for up to one year, and that can be extended on a year annual basis, assuming there continues to be evidence that the person is uh, 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 posing a, an imminent danger to themselves or to others. It's the state prosecutors that have the burden of presenting this evidence in court. And uh, as you said, it's been on the books for 23 years. Um, it's never been successfully challenged. And if you start to read the affidavits that are filed by the police, you know, these, these applications to, to get the warrant, you see clear uh, what we now call red flags, right? If you read some of these things, and I have read many of them, you can see it's about to happen. And um, so that's, those are the mechanics of the system. So uh, can you say that it's prevented shootings? I think I read where there's some demonstrable evidence of that. Yeah, I mean, there's no question about it. Now, keep in mind, it's hard to prove a negative, right? Um, and as I said, if you read these things, you, I think any reasonable person would conclude that something really bad was about to happen. But this has been studied by academics, not by me. Um, uh, there was extensive study done by uh, forensic psychiatrists and law professors at Duke University and Yale University, together with our, our mental health agency here in Connecticut. They went through all of the data for the first uh, 15 years, this law being on the books, and they were able to present very convincing evidence that at a bare minimum, there were countless suicides pre prevented by this. And as we all know, many suicides uh, are ultimately murder suicides, right? And um, right. and there's uh, other evidence that indicates that uh, that in these instances, clearly people did have access to firearms and they exhibited all the signs of imminent dangerousness. Now, I just want to throw in a couple of details, which I think they're important to understand, because I know how uh, I, I know what people said when we first debated this law. Right? People criticized this right. as a, uh, including the NRA crowd, right? Uh, that this was a turn in your neighbor law. So, in other words, if you didn't like your neighbor, you call the cops, say, "Well, they've got guns," or they're acting suspiciously, and the cops would go seize right. their guns. Well, that's never panned out, right? There's there's not been a single example of anything even remotely close to that actually happening mm -hmm. what we do know they don't seem to mind that yeah, in the context sure. of abortion in texas they'll turn their neighbor in, they'll turn their neighbor in for that i love the hip the hypocrisy of these people the most likely type of person to reach out to the police and report this is number one a family member 
and number two, a healthcare professional. You know, uh, physicians have a, 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 a duty to keep their conversations with their patients confidential unless they believe that the person is going to hurt themselves or somebody else. Uh, and they have a duty to warn in those instances. And many uh, mental health professionals, ordinary care professionals, doctors, psychologists, others have have reached out to the police and reported things that uh, were a concern. Family members, not next door neighbors, but family members concerned about their loved ones uh, ha have done this. And so it seems like it's worked very well. It's important to point out that in the first, let's say, decade this law was on the books in Connecticut, was used very sparingly, right? Maybe 20, 30, 40 times a year statewide. And, um, and I say that because many of the critics thought that the police were just going to go wild once they had this authority, just target people, et cetera, et cetera. That did not yeah. happen. After the Virginia Tech shootings, when people got a clear picture of a situation where there was clearly somebody who had uh, who posed an imminent risk to himself or to others and was beginning to acquire firearms and people saw it coming, that's where people started to say, you know, maybe uh, I should reach out if I know somebody like this. And I think, you know, Mark and Bob and, and to your listeners, we all know people who seem very high strong and you wouldn't be surprised if they snapped one day. Yeah. And, and some of them we know begin to obsess about firearms. Yeah. And it's when you see those red flags that you sh that certainly I would encourage you uh, to reach out to the police, especially if you're in a state where the police have the authority to do something. You in you indicated that it's hard to prove a negative, but it isn't hard to prove how many people have been referred since the law was passed 23 years ago, right? Correct, yeah. And you it's, could probably uh, tell us hundreds or, or thousands? or uh, I mean, how many people are we talking about? It's in the thousands wow. since... Uh, wow. Since the Sandy Hook shootings in Connecticut, so this is 23 years, keep in mind, but since the Sandy Hook shootings in 2012, the end of 2012, which of course happened here in Connecticut, um, the, the number of people reporting situations to the police has really increased. Now, it, it's a low 200s per year, typically, which is much higher. It's about 10 times higher than it was initially. And I think part of the reason for that is it took a while for police to get used to the fact they have this authority and how it works, right? Mm -hmm. uh, right? We were the first state to do it. The next state was about 10 years later, it was Indiana. So for all that first decade, uh, it was really a unique mechanism. And, and, and I'm sure you're aware that in the law enforcement community, uh, not most, but there are more than a few law enforcement officers that have strong ideological views about firearms. And I think uh, if you're in that category, you're very reluctant to do it, even if you think maybe it's justified. So it took a while to overcome that um, lack of understanding plus resistance in the law enforcement community. Plus, on top of that, I, I, especially with the recent spate of mass shootings where innocent people are just being gunned down for no apparent reason, um, I think people are much more likely to reach out to the police and yeah. report this. So as a result, I think I would think, though, that it's fair to argue that, that if there are thousands of people who have been referred over a 23-year period, there are also thousands of lives that have been saved by those referrals. There's no question. No brainer, right? You mentioned the NRA and and, and the Second Amendment, and, and I've long argued, uh, almost to myself in the mirror, because nobody listens, especially on the other side that the Second Amendment doesn't say the things that Second Amendment advocates say it says. It simply gives us a right to bear arms, which at the time that it was written was a two-shot musket. Um, I'm wondering what your response is to people who say that a red flag law, of all things, which sounds as reasonable as hell, violates the Second Amendment. Yeah, well, it definitely does not violate the Second Amendment, right? Um, and let's talk about the Second Amendment for a few Please. minutes. Um, as you point out, when that was written and uh, incorporated in the U.S. Constitution, um, it was almost it, it was literally impossible to even conceptualize the kinds of stuff we're dealing with today. For example, uh, and I was surprised to learn this not long ago, you know, the bullet had not even been invented yet. Oh my! When the Second Amendment was enacted, 
and the guy who invented it had not even been born yet when the Second Amendment was incorporated. That's interesting. And and so the idea that there there's even such a thing as a bullet, let alone an AR-15, is completely foreign to the to to the U.S. Constitution. That's number one. Number two, and I just want to be clear about what did a gun shoot back then? Um, Pellet? Is that what we're? I mean, what are we talking about? Pellet. Okay. Pellets. You know, there must be you you put your powder in and and you know that kind of thing. But in any event, with the bullet, which is much more precise and goes a lot farther, more accurately, had not even been invented yet, let alone the bullets that are used today. So, but having said all that, um, so the Second Amendment is there. It says what it says. We got it. as an elected official for many years, right now I'm on the New Haven Board of Police Commissioners and the State Police Officer Standards and Training Academy. I've been appointed by the governor to that. I have to take an oath of office to do all of those things. And in that oath, I swear to to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the state of Connecticut and of the United States. So I support what it says in the Constitution. Right. But it doesn't say what people say it says, right? And, 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 and so... Uh, don't forget, there's a lot of rights in the Bill of Rights, the first 10 amendments, right? For example, we all have the right to vote if we're a U.S. citizen. But in order to vote, uh, we have to register. We can only vote in a certain place at a certain time. We can only vote once. Uh, and we can lose the right to vote under certain circumstances and depending on what state you're in. Um, you know, so there's a lot of rights that, you know, seem pretty straightforward, but really are much more nuanced than you would think. On the Second Amendment itself, right, um, it says your right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. And, you know, the, the gun folks are uh, frequently say stuff like, well, what part of shall not be infringed do you not understand? OK, if, if it means you can't do anything, why is it that anywhere, anytime people want to get close to former President Trump, they're not allowed to have guns, including at the NRA convention? Why isn't that a violation of the Second Amendment? <laughs> Does it mean that prisoners in prisons get to have guns with them or visitors to prisons? Because we're infringing all those people's rights, if that's how you define it. So it's really an absurd argument that that it means no rules, never under any circumstances. And so um, it's all about reasonable rules that are related to a legitimate government objective. And I think saving people's lives without completely and totally banning firearms is is fair game uh, under the United States Constitution. Yeah. Now, Mike, um, the red flag law proposal is part of the package of of uh, of, of bills that uh, is being considered in the Senate and that um, and that President Biden has pushed. Are you working with any lawmakers in Washington regarding this or are being consulted by any of them? Uh, <laughs> As this goes along, uh, yeah, not directly. Yeah. That's for sure. Um, I, I, you know, Chris Murphy and I know each other. Mm-hmm. We were in the state legislature together for a long time. Mm-hmm. Uh, in fact, Chris was like a, a, a an intern at, at the state capitol when I was in my earlier legislative days. So, and I have a lot of respect for Chris. And over the years, we we've spent a lot of time talking. Same thing with Senator Blumenthal here in Connecticut. Mm-hmm. Um, they they understand these rules very well uh, as Attorney General. Senator Blumenthal defended defended all of our uh, uh, regulations on gun ownership and possession, et cetera. So they they know the Connecticut system pretty well. They don't need my uh, current advice right now. Let me say this. Um, uh, They're not debating a federal red flag law because this really, at the end of the day, falls to local law enforcement to carry out. What they are talking about are incentives to states Ah. to... Uh, the, the the 31 states that don't currently have any type of red flag law, incentives for them to enact such a thing, uh, training for law enforcement, because that's a big part of the problem here. It's one thing to have the law in the books. It's another thing to have the police carry it out, right, as in, as designed. And so that's the red flag proposal uh, that's being discussed in Congress. And I think that's perfectly appropriate. It would be a big step forward. And, and I want to say one more thing about this. You know, people often say, including uh, people on our side, let's say the folks in favor of reasonable gun control, um, they say, well, you know, after all these tragedies, nothing has happened. Right. Well, it's true that nothing has really happened in Congress, but in states around the country, which are really the incubators of good and bad policy alike, 
a lot has happened here in Connecticut for sure. But look at Florida. Right. After the Parkland shootings, Florida adopted a red flag law. And right. the way they wrote theirs, they're using it thousands of times every year. Right. And so if Florida can do it, you would right. think at some point the Congress can get around. You to would it. think. Mike, can you can you explain for the people when we talk about red flag laws at the state level versus the federal level? Um, for instance, there's a federal law called the Lawful Commerce and Arms Act that gives the gun industry immunity, and and that preempts a state law if it's passed in violation of that law. Couldn't there be a federal red flag law that mandates what the states do or, or, and how they do it, and how would that work? Yeah, I think the Tenth Amendment makes that next to impossible to mandate states to do stuff. You can incentivize states to do stuff. You can penalize states for not doing stuff, but you really can't mandate it. Um, so uh, whether that's a good system or not is debatable, but I think the, the case law is pretty clear on actually requiring a state to take some action. Eds can step in and do it themselves, right? But I think it's fair to say that the... Uh, the FBI is not going to get involved in the guy at the end of Elm Street in uh, New Haven who, the, you know, the, their doctor thinks, you know, th this is going to be a local law enforcement. No, I enterprise. agree. Uh, that's, that's not what I meant. What I meant is provide criteria for how states would proceed and right. handle and, and, and some and kind of superseding. Yeah, you can't. You can't force local, you can't force state governments to do stuff. What you can do is penalize them, penalize them for not doing it or incentivize if they do do it. And right. this does happen all the time, right? Uh, every state gets very significant uh, Justice Department grants for police, for prisons, for you know probation and parole, et cetera. And those can be, you know, you can uh, put strings attached to all those grants. And that happens all the time. That's the way you could do it. You, you can't mandate them to enact the law, but you, what you can say, it, you can either pass a federal law, and as you say, interstate commerce, you can make it a federal crime, uh, or you could give the jurisdiction to the FBI to get involved. You definitely can do that. But the way, I, I think the way they're debating it is to put strong incentives. Now, keep in mind, whatever's gonna get 60 votes in the Senate, if anything, is not going to have those kinds of strings attached to it. Uh, I, right, fair, by fair my, chance, right. I'm an incrementalist, right? I'll take anything <laughs> at this point because it's taking each step and being able to demonstrate that the worst fears of the most paranoid people never came true, right? Um, there's never been a bill, to my knowledge, that's been proposed where guns would be confiscated wholesale. Right? I mean, which is the sort of the, the the mantra of the National Rifle Association. I mean, that's not being discussed ever, right? I don't know that anyone has ever talked about such a thing. But we're just about reasonable rules. Now, uh, you know, Washington is also considering things like background checks and toughening background checks, requiring training requirements for the purchase of firearms and uh, ammo, just like uh, Connecticut has done. Uh, do you think there's any chance that any of those provisions will be included? We'll get Mike Lawler's response to that question when we come back. I, I, I can see them broadening the scope of the existing federal law that requires background checks for weapons purchased at federally licensed firearm dealers. That's the Brady Law. It dates back to the early 90s. So if you want to go buy a handgun at a federally licensed gun dealer, they're going to do an instant right. check on you. Uh, there are a lot of flaws with that system. It's yeah. better than nothing. But let me compare it for a second to the system Connecticut has, because I personally think Connecticut is the model for the country with regard to licensing, sales, transfers of firearms, right? So in Connecticut, if, if you want to buy any firearm, a shotgun, a rifle, a handgun, doesn't matter, you need first to have already obtained from the state police a license. In order to get that license, you have to, number one, go through a six-hour training course. Number two, 
you have to pass a very expansive background check, which does not rely on the national instant check system. It instead relies on the wide range of information available to law enforcement through their own data systems, right? And that would include uh, red flags that we saw in some of the most recent shootings, which don't pop up on the national instant check system, it requires a face-to-face -face interview with law enforcement officers. And on top of that, it takes months to get one of these licenses. So what we saw in Buffalo wow. and what we saw in Texas and what we saw in Oklahoma, where the, the shooters had just gone in to buy the weapons they used in, in two cases on the day they used them. Right. That cannot happen here. This impulse buying, spur of the moment stuff cannot happen here. If you, so unlike the federal system, Every private transfer of a firearm in Connecticut is treated almost like selling a car, right? Every, every weapon has, is in essence, a title. If you want to sell it to your next door neighbor or your brother-in-law or some guy at a gun show, you need, number one, to make sure the person to whom you're selling it has a currently valid license from the Connecticut State Police. The way you validate that is you reach out to the state police say, I'm talking to Mike Lawler here. He's got a license. It's number one, two, three, four, five, six. They say it's either valid or not valid today. Just like if you get pulled over for speeding, the cop's going to run your, your license and your plate number to see if those are currently valid. And then once they confirm that it's, it's, it's a legit license and it hasn't been suspended because you just beat the crap out of your wife the day before, they will give you an authorization number. You write that authorization number on a form together with the serial number of the weapon and you transfer it to the new owner and you forward that now to the state police. If a weapon that you had acquired ends up in somebody else's hands and you did not go through that process, you get arrested, right? If your weapon is stolen, you have a legal requirement to report that to the police within 72 hours of theft, whenever it could have, should have been reasonably discovered. And if you don't do that, you get arrested. So. We have a system for tracking who's got what firearms, making sure that all these transfers are going to people who are who have already passed an extensive background check. You see none of that in states like Texas and Florida. And even in New York, they don't have that kind of comprehensive system. Well, the same thing in South Carolina. I live in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. They have gun shows here every, you know, twice a year, big gun shows. And people can go there. I went I went to see for myself. You can you can walk in there. You can purchase a uh, a uh, AK forty seven from a private uh, seller uh, with no back with no background check at all. They don't even have to ask your name. No, no. You just give them the money and walk out with a gun. Correct. That's it. And by the way, here let me just add: in Connecticut, same rules apply to purchasing ammunition. You can't even buy bullets unless you have one of these licenses, yeah. and. Uh, AR-15s and other assault weapons are just banned altogether, as are large capacity magazines. So, yeah. you know, uh, follow up, follow up to uh, to Bob's question and your and your just made comment. Uh, Connecticut has an assault weapons ban, right? Yeah, we. It's been uh, okay. it's back okay. in '93, but it's been revised multiple times because the gun manufacturers try and identify loopholes, and they make new guns that don't qualify. And for example, the gun that was used in the Sandy Hook shooting was a Bushmaster AR-15, and they had modified it just slightly so that it didn't fall under our ban. After that, the ban, the definition of what counts as an assault weapon was expanded to cover all that kind of stuff. And, and on that topic, let me just be clear about this. Everyone points to the NRA as really the bad guys here. Based on my experience, the real bad guys, the Pullet Bureau of the gun industry, is something called the National Shooting Sports Foundation, the NSSF, which ironically is headquartered in Newtown, Connecticut, right? Those are the ones who have been driving and funding the National Rifle Association together with the Russians, of course. And, and their only interest is to aggressively market these weapons to people who they know are inclined to, to acquire them. And, you know, they just got sued. Remington, which made that weapon, the Bushmaster, got sued in Connecticut successfully, notwithstanding the federal law, right. because of what, the, how they were marketing this. They were putting ads targeting young adolescent men saying stuff like, earn your man card, right? That was the, with a picture of one of these AR-15s. 
the Daniel's Defense, the company in Georgia that made the AR-15s that were used in the recent Texas shooting, you could look at their ads. They have like little children holding, I mean, little children, like two-year-olds holding AR-15s with their dads right there. So proud. I mean, this kind of marketing yeah. has what led has what has led to the proliferation of these weapons in our country since the federal assault weapon ban expired in 2004. We have politicians down okay. here in South Carolina that are running ads with their whole family, uh, little kids all the way up to mom and dad holding uh, holding weapons in their ad. And and it's just sickening. Uh, I've actually written I've actually written several articles and a novel on that very issue about how how to avoid uh, the immunity issue, but uh, but uh, on the assault weapons ban, uh, I want to I want to ask you uh, three questions. One, do you see any possibility that they'll increase the age to twenty one? Two, do you see any kind of assault weapons ban uh, being passed at the at the um, federal level? And three, what is your advice to a coward politician who would love to do both, yet is afraid of the NRA or the organization in Connecticut you just mentioned? Uh, your first question was what? Are you, uh, age. 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 Uh, and, and whether. Yeah, it's important to understand that under federal law, you have to be 21 to buy a handgun, right? And, and, and. That seems to be constitutional, right? No one seems to be arguing that point. Um, but you have to be 18 to buy a rifle. Um, I, it's, it would seem like a perfectly reasonable, to, even in Connecticut, by the way, you can buy a rifle, not an AR-15, but a rifle, like a shotgun um, or 22 um, at 18, right? As long as you have one of these permits, which are hard to get. Uh, but, and, and there's... You know, New York State just raised the the age up to 21 for rifles, um, and and I hope Connecticut does the same. So, um, it would seem to be a perfectly reasonable thing to do. All these rules tend to have small exceptions, like if dad wants to take the kid out hunting or something like that. But um, the the so, I, I think it's unlikely, right? I mean, it seems perfectly reasonable. It's unlikely. So, as is the case of many things, it's probably going to go to the states to, to really state by state, raising it up um, uh, to 21, which would make perfect sense. Ideally, just ban them all together. Uh, that seems unlikely at the moment. Um, but, you know, I, I was having this conversation with uh, in a different interview a couple of weeks ago, believe it or not, before, uh, before the Texas shooting, before the Buffalo shooting. And uh, the, the, in the interview, I was asked the question, what's it going to take right to to get these uh changes and, and i question. remember saying and i'm not claiming it's i was being prophetic and i said well here's what i know if these types of mass shootings continue especially school shootings um it's the, the date on which those things are going to happen is going to get closer and closer and closer if there's never another mass shooting if there's never another school shooting this this discussion will drop from uh the political campaigns right and but it seems like the pace of these mass shootings is accelerating right it's a church it's a school it's a supermarket it's a shopping center um and and you know how many have there been just in the last couple of weeks right so i i think if this pace continues um it's way more likely that the congress will take action um and and unfortunately you know, the, the country has been flooded with weapons of all description. The rate at which guns are being pumped into the American population has accelerated in recent years. And, and you know, the NRA is bragging about how many how many guns have been sold, record numbers of guns, which is true, right? But it's also worth noting, it's not so much that more people who never had guns before are deciding to own guns. People who own guns decide they need a lot of guns. And when these red flag warrants are executed in Connecticut, it is not unusual to find 10, 20, 30, 40, 100 firearms, thousands of rounds of ammunition in, in these places. And, um, you know, like I'll give you a, a shocking statistic, right? Uh, there was a, under the 
post Sandy Hook law in Connecticut, where we expanded the definition of what counts as an assault weapon. Uh, as we had done previously, we said, if you already legally possessed one of these weapons, we're about to ban, uh, you can keep, but you have to register the fact that you've got it, right? And there's all these rules about what you can and can't do with that gun if you register it. So my question to the state police is just out of curiosity, the person who registered the most newly banned assault weapons so that he could keep them legally, how many did he register? The guy who <laughs> and isn't that a red, and isn't that a red flag issue? <laughs> One hundred and eighty-six. Oh my god! And those are just the newly banned ones. Like, and we also requ- we said you could keep your large capacity magazines if you uh, uh, declare to the state police how many you have and what types you have because they don't have serial numbers on them. And wouldn't that trigger the red flag? Though? You would think one guy. <laughs> Wait to hear this. One guy declared that he personally owned over 450,000 large capacity magazines. Are you shitting me? Oh my God. And, huh? and these weren't outliers, right? There was a lot of people in these huge, and, and, and these are just the ones that weren't so paranoid that they decided to comply with the law and register with it. How many people are survivalists and have underground bunkers loaded up with stuff that they would never in a million years declare to the police. Oh but, but I mean, it just gives you some sense of what, what this subculture in the U S yeah. uh, what's going on there. And, yeah. you know, I'm sure you're like me, you saw these scenes from the Michigan state Capitol a year ago yeah. where the protesters showed up inside the Capitol building with fully loaded AR 15s over their shoulders. Yeah. Imagine if on January 6th, yeah, the yeah. government didn't have very strict rules about bringing guns into the district. Imagine what would have happened if that crowd showed up there with their AR-15s once Uh, things started to spin control. So, I mean, this is a real challenge for our country on so many different levels. I want to read you something. I just got a a pitch from a right-wing PR guy who who works for the right-wing nut gun gun nuts. Uh, And he says... In a time when President Joe Biden is calling for a full-on gun ban, which isn't true, some believe that there may be the need for another solution, constitutional carry. This means that a person can legally own a firearm and carry it in public, either visibly or concealed, at almost any time or place. With more people like this, it's believed that mass shootings can be more quickly resolved without further loss of life. Comment. So, uh, okay. A <laughs> um, couple of things. Uh, I, you know, I was elected in the, to the legislature in 1986. And uh, in late 80s, early 90s, crime was literally out of control in the country. Uh, and there was, there was hearings on various forms of gun control back then. And, and I can remember people testifying in front of our committee. And essentially what they were saying was the Second Amendment was all about owning guns so they can defend themselves against the government they consider to be tyrannical. And that's why the Constitution contains the Second Amendment. And I remember thinking to myself, so, so basically what you're saying is if you don't agree with the government, you reserve the right to go out and start shooting people. Is that what you're basically saying? Because I'm pretty confident that's why the founders put elections in the Constitution, right? If you didn't like the way things were going, you just change them. So that, that's number one. Number two, this whole constitutional carry thing, right? Okay. In Connecticut... You have a right to carry a firearm. You do. Yeah. Right? You you have to pass certain screen, and we have the uh, 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 jurisdiction to refuse you permission to do that, and to enforce that with criminal statutes, based on uh, actual reasons that we can articulate. Right, that we have to prove that we here's why we don't think you're suitable to own a firearm, and right. that's been the system forever here. Yeah. Um, and and so, um, but you the Connecticut Constitution, unlike the federal Constitution, it says every citizen has the right to bear arms in defense of himself and the state. Period. No mention of a rel. So, okay, that's what it says, and that's a right that you have in Connecticut. But so where is where is the thing that happened? And and I and I ask this of uh, gun owners all the time, who are in Connecticut. I say, what is it that you want to do that you're not allowed to do in our state? Right. Because they've all got these licenses. They can buy as many guns as they want. Right. And 
and and and it's just such a misconception. And as you pointed out right at the beginning and asking the question, President Biden has not proposed anything that's like no, a broad scale not. gun ban, right? No one's talking about confiscating. That's never. And I say to people like here in Connecticut, where we've had Democrats, pro gun control people running the state for a very long time. Sure. Nothing like that's ever happened. When I was working for former Governor Malloy as his criminal justice guy after the Sandy Hook shootings, we did a big, very comprehensive uh, 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 set of reforms dealing with guns. And when this was going on, some of these, let's just call them gun advocates, were saying online that there was a meeting that I attended with the state police where we were planning a mass confiscation yeah. of firearms. Like, how many was that not true? Like, nothing like that ever even remotely happened or was discussed or you know i mean and and so in their heads they had this idea that that's something that's in the hopper or under consideration this is that whole slippery well, slope that, argument right the, the, that if you if you ban assault weapons they'll come after the next the next level of guns and the next level of guns until they're yeah, guess, guns. that's right? that's that baloney and, and that's an that argument you, i mean we did marriage equality here in Connecticut. And I remember one of the arguments was, well, once you do that, there's going to be polygamy and bestiality. Like, okay. When someone proposes any one of those things, then make your case, right? But, but like, this is crazy. And, and I really think this NSSF, right, that I mentioned earlier, who are right, who are cooking the, up these things because they know that there are many people in the country that yeah. fall for this stuff, right? Uh, and and they're going to sell a lot of guns and they're going to make a lot of money. That's what's really going on here. And, you know, I think it's up to what sort of level. By the way, and I'm sure you know this. The, the majority of gun owners in the country like support almost every single piece of yeah. legislation we're talking about here. Right. It's only these extreme people that that, you know, are filled with fear and anxiety and resentment that have these yeah. paranoid delusions that somehow you know and you know flip it around obviously if guns made i mean plenty of people say this but let me just say it, if guns made you safer then the united states would be by yeah. far the safest country in the yeah. world right and the opposite yeah. is the case when it comes to gun yeah. violence or murders even you know so mike i'm not um, sure that you answered crazy, the but, last part of mark's question which was what's your advice to to the um chicken shit politicians who would would like to uh uh support the ban on semi-automatic semi-automatic assault weapons but are but are afraid of the nra and and the other organizations this does require people to be on some level profiles and courage right and uh sometimes uh principle is more important than your political career yeah, I'm not sure how many people in Congress would value um, principle over their political careers, yeah. right? Uh, you see a little bit of this now with the January 6th stuff, you know, Liz Cheney and a few others. But um, but I, I, I think there's a much bigger problem in, in the Republican Party in particular uh, where uh, fear um, of retaliation from what they call the base over there is is just getting in the way. Sooner or later, they have to deal with that bigger problem. And guns are just a symptom of it, right? Uh, but there's a lot of other angles here. Interestingly, you brought up abortion earlier, right? And and um, this is, assuming the Supreme Court does what we all assume they're going to yeah. do in the next week or two, um, that it, people have made the analogy, here's where the dog catches the car, yeah. right? Like, now what are you going to do, right? And 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 there's a there's a decision pending there which is related to the second amendment and although it's way narrower than the overturning of roe versus wade even if they decide it the wrong way um that i you know it, it's the, the proliferation of guns in this country could become more extreme depending on what happens and and all we know for sure is that will lead to more and more firearm deaths, suicides, accidents, homicides. And, and, you know, at some point the pain will be unsustainable, I think. And, but I, I just wonder for the, on a, on a, pra on, a pra on a practical level though, Mike, uh, um, 
I'm I'm confused. It seems to me that Connecticut has an assault weapons ban. Connecticut's not the only state that has an assault weapons ban. You can assault, you can pass an assault weapons ban at the state level. Somebody who owns an assault weapon and has that weapon banned can appeal that decision to take his weapon away to the Supreme Court of the United States at some point. Uh, they have to hear it. Uh, they have to be willing to hear it. Mm-hmm. But I, I've never seen an assault weapons ban at the state level challenged at the federal oh. level in, in, in the Court of Appeals or the Supreme Court. If they're okay at the state level, then they're okay at the federal level, right? For sure. They're not, they don't violate the damn Second Amendment. For sure. But it, it, in fact, our, <laughs> our, uh, I think our Sullivan ban was like the second or third state in the country to do it in 1993. And it did get appealed. It did end up at the United States Supreme Court. They didn't even take the case, right? It was upheld in, in right. the circuit court. And, right. and so, you're, as you point out, it's, also, it's true that no court has ever ruled that an assault weapon ban regardless of how it's written, is a violation of the Second Amendment. All right. Now, just like Roe versus Wade, that could change. That's not what they're being... Now, they could write their decision in this case that they've got in, in an expansive way that, among other things, would overturn bans like this. Who knows? But um, yeah. it hasn't happened yet. Mike, thanks for joining us today on Justice Counts. It was an informative and fascinating conversation, and Mark Bellow and I are grateful. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Meanwhile, if you haven't done so already, please check out Mark Bellow's Rip from the Headlines legal thrillers, all available online at Amazon and other major online booksellers. He has quite the hero in attorney Zachary Blake, who fights for justice on all fronts. His books are Betrayal of Faith, Betrayal of Justice, Betrayal in Blue, Betrayal in Black, Betrayal High, Supreme Betrayal, Betrayal at the Border, and his latest you have the right to remain silent. For more information, just check markmbello.com. Until next time, this is Bob Gaddy for Mark Bello, signing off from Justice Counts.